So we are now recording. Okay, so welcome again to today's webinar. The title of today's webinar is Copyright and Fair Use Guidelines for Online Courses. One of the webinars in the series of webinars that we've been offering uh, at Mount St. Mary College under the heading of Lunch and Learn Webinars Online. And so today's webinar is presented uh, by the Office of Online Learning. So thank you. So first important to note is that this webinar is being recorded. So we will be sending all the participants a link to the recording with some additional resources after the webinar has ended, which also will include a PowerPoint slide so that you are able to sift through the PowerPoint slides on your own and also link to any of the resources that we've provided. Uh, by no means are you required to speak uh, through the microphone or use your webcam during this webinar. So if you have them both working, that's OK, but by no means do you have to use either of them. And lastly, we will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, so again, please use the chat feature if you have any questions, and we'll be sure to get to them at the end of the webinar. So today's facilitators are myself, Kristen Delazala. I'm the Director of Online Learning in the Office of Online Learning at Mount St. Mary College. And we also have with us today Dr. Stephanie Pietros, who's an assistant professor of English in the Division of Arts and Letters, and Derek Sanderson, who's an assistant librarian in the MSMC Library. So thank you, facilitators, for being here today. So let me briefly go over some of the things that we will uh, talk about today in, um, in today's webinar although some extra things may come up and we'll, we'll allow some time for that. So first, we'll introduce the topic of copyright and fair use guidelines for online courses. And then we'll talk a little bit about what is copyright and what is fair use in terms of definitions that we'll use for, for our discussion today. And then we will move into some specific MSMC resources including the MSMC Library um, Copyright and Fair Use Guidelines website which includes guidelines for fair use and copyright compliance. It also includes fair, a fair use checklist for instructors, both adjunct and full-time instructors, new and instructors who've been working for some time. And we will also talk about the TEACH Act. Um, and there's also a resource on the MSMC Library website about that. And then we'll sort of end with um, the specificity of online online learning and online courses and technology and how copyright and fair use guidelines come into play with online coursework. Um, we'll present some common scenarios, some questions that come up frequently from instructors and then provide a few solutions and then we'll conclude the webinar. So let me first start off by saying by no means is this webinar um, supposed to replace any legal advice in any way. Uh, we are here as a resource uh, at Mount St. Mary College to provide as many resources as we can on the topic of copyright and fair use. And by no means is this um, does this include everything that there is to know about the two topics. There's it's it's a rich there's rich information, a wealth of information about both topics that we simply won't be able to cover today. So we're just going to sort of su superficially talk about the topics and the resources that we can provide here at Mount St. Mary College. So why is this topic important, uh, copyright and fair use? Well, Mount St. Mary College has been offering online courses now for several years. And we've seen an increase in the offering of online courses in the last couple years. Um, not only are instructors at the Mount offering fully online courses, but they're also offering hybrid courses or flipped classroom model courses or courses that are simply not online but are using web-enhanced materials through the learning management system. Um, and we see many questions pop up from new instructors or instructors that have been here for some time on what is the nature of copyright and fair use. So talking about it. I think is important for, for the institution. So first, let's define what copyright is, and, and then we'll talk about the context of it 
within Mount St. Mary College and in terms of online courses. So copyright protects the authors of original artistic and intellectual works once uh, those works are fixed in a tangible medium, including digital media. And so for the most part, any work published before 1923 is not protected by copyright and is considered to be in the public domain. And so for any questions on whether or not something is in the public domain, uh, the American Library Association has come up with a digital copyright slider, which is presented here as a link. And I now want to turn this sort of um, this slide over to Stephanie to talk about this in a little bit more detail in terms of a definition of copyright. Sure. So um, these are the basics. Uh, I guess the important thing to note, you know, I talked in my uh, elective this semester uh, with my students about um, how important copyright was uh, for the publishing industry and particularly for authors um, when it was developed. It, it didn't even even exist um, until uh, the 18th century. Um, and uh, I would say that the copyright slider uh, that's linked here is going to be a really important tool um, to determine if something um, is in the public domain. I mean, usually you can tell these things in a kind of um, basic way. If you look on Google Books and something is there in its entirety that it's probably in the public domain, but if it's only, a, you know, I tell my students if it's just a preview, that's a good hint to know that it's not in the public domain. Um, but the, the copyright slider will give you some um, of the nuances, right? Not just if it was published uh, before 1923, but um, some of the other um, indicators um, in terms of um, how long, if the, the author is still alive, if they're not, how long has passed. Um, so those are some of the other factors um, that would influence whether something is still protected by copyright law uh, or not. Um, I don't know, Derek, if you have anything to say about the, uh, the copyright slider. Um, I don't really have anything about the copyright slider. It's a, a very good resource. And the only thing I would add, and this probably is not going to come up a lot um, for our purposes here, but it may, is that public domain doesn't necessarily always mean the item is free for use. Um, there are instances in which item is indeed in public domain, but there may be other channels uh, that people have to go through to really confirm that that work um, can be used freely by them. Uh, there, are, there are deceptive cases in that sense. What would be one of those, just out of curiosity? Um, there are sometimes instances of photographs that are in the public domain. Um, that is, the, the copyright is no longer owned by the photographer, but there may be a, a photographic agency that is, in the meantime, picked up the copyright. Either an agency the photographer worked for or an agency that goes around buying copyrights of old photographs. So it, it can appear that because it's not owned by the photographer anymore, that it's freely available, but um, that's not entirely the case. Yeah, that makes sense. That would be a specific. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, it gets yeah. tricky with things that were published a really long time ago. The author is clearly uh, dead, but you know, there's a current edition of something. Um, and so it, it gets, you know, tricky, like uh, certain editions of Shakespeare's plays. I mean, he's obviously not alive, but certain publishers have, and editors have copyrighted editions. Um, but there are other ones that are freely available. So, yeah, it does get a little bit mucky sometimes. Yeah, I think that's another good example, because there are specific uh, editions of works that are under copyright, even though the work is speaking may be freely available online. Right. Yeah. Uh, thank I apologize. You. My son is participating in the background a little bit here. <laughs> yeah. Th thank you, Derek. Uh, 
and and Stephanie. Um, oops. So um, let, let's also provide uh, a definition for fair use um, as we continue this discussion. Um, so fair use doctrine means that there are exceptions to copyright law specifically for educational purposes. And so Congress has not provided precise specifications, but rather flexible factors to evaluate what constitutes fair use. Um, so examples of that would be the purpose and character of the use, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole, and lastly, the effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. And so in terms of a definition, before we move on, Stephanie and Derek, do you want to add to that definition of fair use? Um, I, I don't have much to say, except um, that... I would, uh, sorry, I was getting my microphone unmuted. Um, no problem. I would add, um, fair use can, I, I think one important thing to keep in mind um, is that it can depend on, a lot on the type of media uh, people are using. Um, music, for example, is a lot more restrictive when it comes to fair use then say, well, the example I gave earlier of uh, photography, um, just because of the nature of the copyright laws behind the different media, um, fair use becomes less flexible or more flexible, depending on what you're talking about. Yeah, I don't have much to add. I mean, I think it's just um, the important thing to keep in mind is that it is a little bit flexible, um, and so I won't say too much about it because I know it's on an upcoming slide, but there are, we do have some resources um, available at the Mount to kind of help you gauge uh, these four uh, factors, right, that, um, you know, it, and I think it's a lot of it comes down to a, a good faith effort to make sure that you are, you know, as far, it, it, to the extent that you're able, um, you know, using it fairly. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. Um, so let's now move into, we have sort of a basic definition of fair use and copyright. Um, and let's talk now about some Mount St. Mary guidelines for fair use and copyright. So there was a website that was developed by the college in 2010, 2011, and specifically by the Faculty Library Committee. And it's now maintained by the MSMC Library. And this website is intended to provide guidelines for understanding and applying copyright values. And if you look at the image to the right, you'll see that this is a snapshot of the library's website, which includes information on not only what is copyright, uh, but what is the public domain, what is fair use, and also provides a fair use checklist and teach act checklist, which helps instructors to navigate uh, these topics and also includes some information about online learning specifically and e-class. So Stephanie, I know you have some intimate knowledge of, of this website from providing a previous tutorial. Do you want to expand on this? Um, well, I just, I think that, you know, that our definitions of copyright and uh, fair use here are, are drawn from this. Um, but this is a really helpful um, tool. So if you look on the bottom, right-hand corner of the main library page, it'll link you to this. Um, and uh, to my mind, the things that are, are most helpful here um, are those checklists uh, in terms of fair use and then the TEACH Act, which is, we'll talk about in a bit, but the act that governs um, online uh, learning. Um, and I, so I think those are really useful if you have uh, questions and you don't have to wade through tons and tons of material. Um, and there's also um, a tutorial as well, which is about 10 minutes um, and kind of provides an overview of the site. Uh, but I, I think the checklists are probably um, the, the quick fixes that you might need, you know, in, in a moment of need when you're designing a course and getting ready to put the e-class up or whatever the case may be. Yeah, and there's a link below um, that will be provided in the PowerPoint to, to link directly to the Mount St. Mary website. So 
So one of the resources that's included in in the website is the Fair Use Checklist for Instructors, which is very helpful. And this is a snapshot from what that part of it looks like. And instructors can access, um, assess whether a particular use of a copyrighted work falls within fair use provisions of copyright law by evaluating their intended use against the four factors that Stephanie has um, already spoken about a little bit and we will talk about in, in just a moment. So there's a link to the Mount St. Mary Fair Use Checklist for instructors on, on this slide. So let, let's now dive a little bit into uh, the specifics of the checklist for fair use. Um, as noted here, uh, not all characteristics will be present in any given situation. It's important to check uh, only those that apply to your specific use. And no single characteristic or factor determines fair use. So factor number one is purpose and character of the use of the work. Factor two is the nature of the copyrighted work. Factor three, amount and substantia substantiality of the portion used. And last, effect on market for original. And did you want to add to this either Stephanie or Derek? Just add as a, as a practical recent example that I think a lot of people are familiar with um, is the the Robin Thicke, Marvin Gaye uh, lawsuit. The, um, the family of Marvin Gaye sued Robin Thicke and uh, Pharrell, Pharrell Williams, for um, appropriating Marvin Gaye's song, Got to Give It Up for um, Robin Thicke's Blurred Lines. Um, and this, was, this is an example of how restrictive uh, even a fair use argument can be. Um, when it comes to when it comes to music, I mean, the basic argument was in the case was that uh, Robin Thicke and Pharrell Williams had uh, not transformed um, Marvin Gaye's original song adequately enough to argue um, for fair use, and that they had used uh, a substantial enough portion of the original composition. Because um, I don't believe they sampled it. I think they, they um, were determined to have really taken the composition. Um, and so this is a case in which, you know, fair use, keeping in, keeping in mind all these factors, uh, was not effective enough to argue um, for the appropriation of somebody else's work. Um, mainly for factors, factor one and factor three, I think. But even some of factor four, I know the, the Marvin Gaye's family argued that um, you know, this, in certain ways, affected the market uh, for Marvin Gaye's music. Yeah, uh, and, and certainly. On that last point, in terms of the effect on the market for the original, something that I know that comes up um, fairly frequently, I guess, in a classroom context, um, is the use of, say, workbooks or um, recordings, um, say, that accompany a textbook or something like that. Um, and, you know, can you provide, uh, you know, copies of that to a student? Um, and, uh, you know, if it's going to, you know, affect the market of the original, right? The publisher's not going to be able to, it's not selling as many of those workbooks and they're still in print or whatever the case may be. Um, that's something um, I know that comes up quite a bit, particularly if, you know, related to factor three, you're using a substantial portion of it. Um, you know, so they, they, they do uh, bleed into one another a little bit there. Yeah, and, and for and factor three, I mean, that's, that's an issue that comes up frequently in the library, too, when we're, um, we're putting things on e-reserve. Um, we sometimes have to tell people we can't, um, can't put, you know, half of a book on e-reserve because that's taking too much of the original work and placing it online, even though it is uh, for educational purposes. Uh, the, the rule is usually 10%. Yeah, and, and, a good and certainly there's many examples, right, of 
when this may come into question. Um, and so another resource provided by Mount St. Mary um, is um, information about the TEACH Act, which not only applies to the online classroom, but also applies to the face-to-face -face classroom. And the TEACH Act is the Technology, Education, and Copyright Harmonization Act of 2002. Um, it's an act of the United States Congress, and the importance of the TEACH Act stems from the previous copyright laws that allow educators to copy documents or use copyrighted materials in a face-to-face -face classroom or online setting. And certainly, this doesn't necessarily give more permission for an instructor versus someone else um, to infringe on copyright, but certainly it gives um, a certain set of rights and responsibilities to someone who's teaching um, and using educational materials. So the TEACH Act is important in articulating the kinds of things that instructors can do with works. Um, so Mount St. Mary has provided um, a checklist that assists instructors in being able to comply with their requirements. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, what those items are in the checklist in the next slide. So let me move to that slide. Oops, no, nope, sorry, it's in the following slide. Um, so did, Stephanie, before I move to the next slide, did you want to talk about anything regarding the TEACH Act? Um, has anything come up in the classroom for you or other instructors that you're able to provide some examples of, of when this would be important to use? Um, and I think there, I have one example that comes to mind immediately, and Derek can probably speak to this as well, um, but related to uh, showing films um, in class and, uh, you know, um, you know, whether you have uh, public, if, if anyone else um, is going to attend the film screening that's not in the class. Um, this has come up quite a bit with um, the FYE program because sometimes a learning community will open up um, the screening of a documentary or something to other learning communities, which makes it, you know, uh, outside just the scope of the individual classroom. So then you need to make sure you have uh, the, um, uh, is it public? Screening rights. I know Derek, you're you're familiar with that. You, you've helped Public us with that. Public performance. Um, right. So that's one right. kind of major right. thing that I see um, that comes up. Yeah, I think that's the. I think that's one of the more common things. Is this note? The note that um, just because we own the DVD, say in the library. Um, or just because you have access to it to, through Netflix or some other streaming service, you can automatically show it to anybody. And really, as Stephanie said, the restriction is two people in your particular class. Uh, once it's opened up to, um, say, you're showing it in English 101, or you open up to all English 101 classes, that's really a violation of copyright, um, even though it is being showed for an educational purpose. Um. Yeah, sure. Um, and I, I know this comes up frequently with online learning, and we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail in a moment, where an instructor has been using a DVD in the face-to-face -face classroom and has been showing the DVD um, in every class and now moves their curriculum online and wonders if that same DVD can be used um, in the online classroom by reformatting the DVD to become something different. Um, so not only does fair use come into question, but also um, some of the specifics of, of the TEACH Act. And so the, the, the answer to that is no, the DVD cannot be reformatted. And the correct answer would be, is there a streaming version of it or perhaps can the company give permission, if it's a really old movie, can they give permission to, to be able to move it over to the learning management system? Um, so we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. And it, another resource on the Mount St. Mary Library website is the specifics of online learning and technology. Um, and there's a really great statement that's provided on the website 
um, that allows instructors to sort of understand the differences of what takes place online versus in the classroom. And the TEACH Act, again, and the checklist can help to navigate some of those things. So here are the details of the TEACH Act checklist that I had mentioned previously. Um, and there are many, as you can see, outlined in front of you. Um, and so I'll, I'll just provide a couple examples right now for us to sort of use as talking points. Um, all of these should be checked off. Um, ideally, this is what the TEACH Act would say. All of these should be checked off um, before an instructor is, is about to teach a course, whether online or in the classroom. And so a couple examples would be, my institution is non, a nonprofit accredited education institution or governmental agency. So if you can check that off, you're in good shape. Um, also, is your institution, does it have a policy on the use of copyrighted materials? And the answer is yes for Mount St. Mary College, which we've already sort of outlined in some of the resources that are provided in the website. Uh, my institution provides accurate information to faculty, students, and staff about copyright. And the answer for us is yes. Um, and, and again, sort of, you know, we can go down each, each and every one of these, but it's ideal, according to the TEACH Act, that all of these are checked off. And so um, it's, it's pertinent that instructors visit this site before, before they're about to offer a class or create or design curriculum. Did you want to add to this, Stephanie or Derek? I think I think all I would add um, that sort of goes along the lines of what we said about showing a video in class is that under the Teach Act, um, if you're giving people access to something, particularly in an online course, uh, but even in a face-to-face, -face, the basic idea is that only people authorized uh, to see those materials are going to see it. So it would either be students enrolled in the class, or in certain instances it could extend to people um, otherwise affiliated with the college, but it wouldn't be uh, just open uh, on the web for anybody to find, or there's some type of restriction required so that not everybody in the, in the United States or in the world is able to see these things. Yeah, I was going to say something very similar. About two-thirds of the way down the this checklist, there's something I will um, use technology that reasonably limits the student's ability to retain or further distribute the materials. So making sure that only, I mean, this is a feature of eClass, but only students in the class can access it, um, that their access is uh, turned off at the end of the semester. Um, and that there are things, you know, um, I think if you're able to, say, link directly to a website or to a library database, rather than copying material or downloading the article and then re reposting it, um, that also helps as well. Uh, because then the students are accessing it kind of on their own um, rather than, you know, copyrighted material being, uh, you know, duplicated in some way. And, and certainly another point which I have read about um, is, you know, offering the same content with same images with the same resources over and over again throughout the years without um, reassessing whether those things have been cited properly or linked properly. Um, I know in the case of Mount St. Mary College, we do have some courses that are shared by different instructors over the years. And so it's, it's also important that instructors check perhaps another instructor's curriculum to, to make sure that those um, images, that those URLs to library databases are updated or are relevant or are current. Um, which is another important point. So I do now want to sort of shift towards uh, specifically looking at the online environment and technology. We've defined what copyright and fair use is sort of on a basic level. We've gone over some of the resources that the Mount provides for, for instructors to become familiar with the TEACH Act and fair use and copyright. And now I want to talk about some specific scenarios that not only have come up here at the Mount, but that come up frequently at other colleges and, and universities, some common scenarios that we can provide maybe some common so, some solutions for. So um, 
Claremont Colleges uh, has has posted a really great resource um, for understanding digital images, and the link is provided below. And, and this is something that comes up at the mount, too. Um, so a common scenario number one would be an instructor would like to post one or more digital images that were scanned from a book. And they are uh, relevant to the course, of course, uh, that she teaches. And uh, the same images will likely be used in future semesters. So how we would sort of use this framework of copyright and fair use would be to look at the following. Uh, the purpose of the use of the images, and is it educational? So in this case, it is. And so, for example, this would weigh in favor of fair use. Uh, another item would be the law of fair use, and does it apply more narrowly to creative works? And the answer is yes. So in this case, with this example, it is likely that the factor would weigh against fair use. Um, copying multiple images from the same book would definitely weigh strongly against fair use, but a single photo from several books could weigh in favor of fair use. Um, so two other ways of thinking about this would be limiting access to the scanned images, not only to the students enrolled in the course, could tip the factor um, in favor of fair use, which Derek has already mentioned. Uh, but the continued use of the same images semester after semester, which is something I brought up, would likely tip the factor against fair use. And lastly, in this, in this scenario, the professor might check to see if the image is available commercially or if it's in a database of images to which the library already subscribes and then link to the image or request permission from the publisher. So I think what this first scenario sort of um, demonstrates for us is that there's not a black and white way of thinking about copy or fair use, but a sort of a continuum um, with lots of gray areas um, where one portion of the scenario could sort of weigh towards fair use or against it. And so I think critically using some of those checklists that are provided by the Mount would be helpful. Derek or Stephanie, did you want to add to this? I don't have much. Derek might have more. but. Um, I've had good luck finding images on the Credo database, so that's just more of a tip um, related to that last point. Um, there might be other other databases that are really useful. I'm not so sure, but um, that, that's that been really helpful. Um, I also know just from uh, kind of personal uh, experience, because my father-in-law is a photographer, that even if you find things online sometimes, um, they haven't been put there by the uh, the artist's uh, or photographer's permission. Um, so it, it does get sticky. You think it's in, it's public or in some way, um, but it's not. So it's always worth doing due diligence in terms of um, where you're grabbing things from. Yeah, I, I would just second that. Um, I think the important thing here is not um, is not so much focusing on whether it's a gray area or, or how well defined these things are, but that, um, you're actively doing the work to make sure that you're complying with these things. And I think that's what that's what keeps people, that's what keeps institutions out of trouble is when there's a demonstration that even though there might have been a mis misunderstanding, a gray area, whatever it is, that people uh, were doing the work necessary to make sure they complied um, and did the work necessary to hunt down the copyright holder or uh, whatever may be the case. Yeah, and, and I certainly think that's a good point, Derek, in terms of providing a good faith effort towards even citation of the image, image. So, for example, finding an image on Google that you're not exactly sure where it orig originated from, citing where at least you found it um, as, as part of a good faith effort. And then if there's a big question of where it originated from, certainly an image can be purchased, for example, from somewhere like iStock Photo or for the amount to have a, a fairly large marketing department that has a subscription to iStock Photo. So even reaching out to marketing saying, can I look at your repository of images and perhaps take a few um, would be in a good faith effort towards not you know, stealing someone's image, for example. <laughs> Um, 
a common scenario, uh, a common scenario number two would be for full text articles and ebooks. And certainly, Derek, you have a lot more experience in this area, but I'll briefly outline this. Um, an example would be an instructor downloads an ebook from a library subscribed collection and wants to upload the ebook to his learning management course site. And in the case of Mount St. Mary, that would be eClass. And so, a common answer to this would be it would depend on the agreement the library signed with the vendor providing the ebook and to be safe the instructor should probably paste a link to the ebook in the course site and not upload the entire book and so eclass um, our learning management system does does have the feature of um, inserting a, a url to to the library database um, as opposed to simply just uploading the whole ebook into the learning management system and that's what this recommendation would be um, in a similar scenario, and then I'll let Derek sort of take over, um, an instructor wishes to place the full text article he downloaded from the library subscribed database to his uh, learning management course site for use by students enrolled in that class only. And again, as with the ebook situation, some vendor agreements would not consider this fair use, but the instructor could place a link to the article again. And I think this is always good practice when using any sort of resource from um, a subscribed collection or a database is to link to that database as opposed to copy and pasting it within the learning management system or uploading it as, as a whole work. Do you want to add to that, Derek? Well, yeah, I, I, think, I think what's maybe a good, um, a good comparison here is, you know, normally an instructor in a pre-electronic environment is not going to make a copy um, of all the materials for the course and simply hand them out to the students in the class. And uh, by the same token, um, to comply with uh, copyrights and fair uses, you want the students to at least do some of the work, as it were, uh, to find these materials. And so, as Kristen was saying, you provide them the links but they need to follow those links and get these materials themselves uh, so that they are, in a sense, independently finding these materials and not just being handed them wholesale. Um, just as, again, you wouldn't or you shouldn't have been <laughs> in a pre-electronic environment simply copying articles and handing them out to all the students in the class um, if you wanted to comply with copyright. Yeah, ex exactly, Derek. So uh, common scenario number three, which again comes up frequently at the Mount and also uh, Methodist College, which is, has provided um, a great resource relating to websites. Uh, websites containing copyrighted material is, um, is also an issue. So. I wanted to point out that it's it's not allowed or not acceptable to copy and paste information directly from a website. So you may, um, an instructor who's teaching a class may found a, a really great website uh, or maybe a portion of, of the website that they want to offer up to their students who are taking an online course. And so copying directly from the website and then posting it into a learning management system is not acceptable. However, again, um, providing a link to the website or um, having the website pop up as a separate window in the learning management system would be considered best practice in terms of, of copyright. Stephanie or Derek, did you want to add to that? Um, I would just say, you know, this comes up, came up a lot for me this past semester because uh, I was uh, teaching a, a book history course. so. You know, we don't really have um, a special collections at the Mount, so I was linking, uh, having students look at a lot of old books, uh, say, in the digitized collection on the British Library website um, or at the Folger Shakespeare Library. Um, and, you know, it would obviously, uh, given the precious nature of some of that material, it would be and how expensive it has been to digitize them, um, you know, books like, say, Shakespeare's First Folio or uh, you know, illuminated manuscripts, um, you know, it's very easy to link to it. And then, you know, you don't have to worry. Students can look at the, about the quality changing or something like that, um, which sometimes happens if you try to save images from websites and things. Um, so I think it's, 
it's good practice in terms of copyright, but it also the students are going right to the source. It's it's better um, overall uh, for them. Yeah, I, th I think that's that's a very important point. Is that with a lot of this, it's it's not just a matter of uh, complying with copyright. It's, it's also a way of making sure students go uh, to the source, as Stephanie said, and find the exact information they, they need to be finding rather than uh, something that's similar or related or whatever, whatever it may be. Because um, we want to comply with copyright, but we're also, of course, maybe even more concerned with students finding uh, the proper information, um, accurate information. Absolutely, and making sure they can manipulate these these sites and things like that um, right. is important. Yeah, and going back to an earlier point about checking curriculum every semester is that certainly you may offer up uh, a website URL one semester and the next semester it's gone or it's changed or something. So I think checking to make sure it's still current is also probably a good practice. Um, and it certainly means uh, also means if you don't want to offer up the whole website to the students, you can link to it and then just provide a description in the learning management system. Only read, you know, the first half half of the first page of the website. So you can be descriptive um, so the student doesn't also get very confused thinking, oh, you, you know, the instructor has provided a whole website for me, I have to read all of it. Because that's certainly not always the case. Maybe it's just a portion of the website or a page of the website. And certainly the instructor can can write the details of that in the learning management system. So uh, moving into common scenario four out of five, um, this concerns audio and video files. Often there's a movie or a, uh, a song that an instructor just wants to take a small clip from. Um, and so if, if uh, you know, if if the technology is there and you know how to do that, that's great. Um, but you know, copyright and fair use come into play, even if you know you're technologically able to do that. Um, so, um, fair use would say no more than 30 seconds um, without permission for audio. And so, you know, that would pertain to a whole song, for example, only 30 seconds of that, or 10% or three minutes for videos, whichever is less. And so I think where, where it comes into question, um, you know, am I able to do this? Um, you know, finding, you know, resources for, for people who have already made these clips probably helpful. Like, for example, here at the Mount, uh, we have a streaming video site, which is provided here, and Canopy is a streaming video resource that we have on campus that I have has over 700 films that you're able to take small clips of the films so you can sort of like find the specific part of the movie that you want to show and you could take a clip of it and a lot of uh, vendors are offering these types of resources so that instructors don't have to do this on their own and question whether or not it's it's sort of allowed um, so I, th I think this is sort of this is a super gray area, and I think this is a, a contemporary area that's of concern um, when it comes to online learning is, you know, how much can you take of audio or video? Did you want to add to this, Stephanie or Derek? I think it gets really tricky. have a tricky. tremendous amount. Go ahead, Stephanie. Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, and maybe you can speak to this as well. I think it gets really tricky um, when the people do this all the time on YouTube. Um, and so it's easy to go to YouTube and find clips of things. Um, and I have to admit that I probably haven't done my due diligence with regards to this. Um, you know, who knows if, if that's a fair, uh, you know, fair use or, you know, that if that, you know, YouTube is getting better about kind of shutting down um, things that have been put up illegally, but um, there's so much available, um, you know, clips of things, songs, etc. cetera. Um, you know, it, it's easy to, that's easy to access, but that maybe is not, um, you should not be showing in class or, or linking on e-class or whatever. Right. Um, and I think as, as Kristen said, um, services like Canopy 
uh, which we just uh, recently got access to here in the library, um, are sort of filling in that those those gray areas for people where where institutions want access to these things, but they also want uh, legal access to them. And so something like Canopy, which uh, of course we have, is is a foolproof. Uh, you know, if you're pulling video from Canopy, you know that um, you're pulling something that's legitimate. Uh, if you're showing clips in your classes, etc. Um, and so it is a really excellent resource. You know, if you're um, if you're able to find it in Canopy, you know that you're complying with with all the proper laws and guidelines. Um, and it would be a good idea to switch over to it uh, from YouTube or some other uh, service like that if you're not already using it. And I think this is one example of how the face-to-face -face classroom is different than the online classroom because certainly when you're in the classroom and you pull up YouTube uh, and you say to students, you know, I'm going to show you 15 minutes into this video, I'm going to show you a small clip. Uh, makes it a lot more difficult when you want to replicate that same thing online. Um, so I, th I think the work of the instructors a little bit more in terms of developing the curriculum to think about these things ahead of time. Um, and, and also, you know, YouTube, as Stephanie mentioned, is getting a lot smarter at this where they weren't, say, five years ago. So now they're pulling things down that aren't supposed to be there. Um, and again, I think, you know, the technology is there, you know, for example, the Office of Online Learning, we're able to reformat things and we've certainly gotten many requests from instructors to reformat things to make it um, easier to consume by the student, but it doesn't necessarily mean it falls within copyright or fair use just because you can doesn't mean you should kind of thing. Um, so I, I think, again, the design of the curriculum just needs to be a little bit different when offering an online course. And I think that going back to the TEACH Act and that checklist, um, that certainly helps the instructor to navigate you know, the differences of what you can do in the classroom versus what you can do online. And the last scenario I wanted to, to propose here, and there are certainly many, many more scenarios, um, is that of intellectual property. And so many instructors are now developing their own online courses or online course materials and then deciding to share them with other instructors or perhaps leaving a college to get another job and, um, and another instructor jumps in to teach the curriculum. And so uh, instructors sort of you know, now asking questions about what about my own material that I'm creating and how is it protected? How is my work protected? And so the Mount has, has thought about this too. We came up with a distance education policy in 2015 uh, that was passed by our faculty senate which addresses um, some intellectual property questions and answers. Um, and so certainly at any point if there are any questions about your own work, um, and, and the intellectual property surrounding it, certainly this distance education policy um, has some information on that. And of course, Mount St. Mary promotes the application of online learning technologies and multiple courses, but we all want to adhere to copyright and fair use, not only with other work, but the work of, of, our, of our own instructors here at the Mount. Stephanie or Derek, did you want to add to that part? No, I, I really don't have anything to add in this case. That sounds pretty good. Yep, same. I, I sorry, I had to log out and come back, log back in. But no problem. Intro, but I... Great. So the distance education policy is is linked here. If there are further questions about um, one's own intellectual property and work at the Mount. So we're we're coming to a close, and again, I'll, I'll sort of say that we've sort of just touched on the surface of this topic. There's much more um, to certainly talk about, and the Mounts Library website does go into a little bit more detail. And certainly there are staff on campus that can, 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 hap, 
it can help with very specific situations. So if you're interested in designing an online course and want to know more about copyright or fair use, you can certainly contact the Office of Online Learning and I can help or put you in, uh, you know, connect you to someone who can help or you can contact a library staff. I know Derek Sanderson who's here in this webinar has some specific area of expertise here. Um, so certainly contact either office if you have any questions. And I'm going to switch over now to um, to looking into the chat to see if Luan has any questions. Um, so please take the time to enter any of your questions into the chat box um, in, in Adobe right now. So we'll switch over. Okay, so um, Luan, do you have questions for us? And I also see Bob Conti has joined us. Bob, do you have questions? Yeah. Okay, Luan, thank you. And uh, Bob, do you have questions for us? Okay, maybe maybe not. So um, thank you again. For more information, you can certainly contact the Office of Online and Learning or uh, Derek Sanderson in the library or go to the MSMC library site on copyright and fair use. And thank you everyone for attending today. And I want to thank Derek Sanderson and, and Dr. Stephanie Pietros for facilitating today's session. And I hope everyone has a nice day. Thank you. Thank, well, thank you. you, Kristen. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you.